Okay, so now, where's the next session? Patrick Lee and Danny Wu. Please have a seat. So I have the honor to introduce our moderator, Patrick. Um, so if I think everyone, uh, any, uh, my friend circle, and if there is one person who can carry the title um, that with the mix of technology, entertainment, investment, and martial art master, that would be Patrick. <laughs> So Patrick is co-founder and founding CEO of Rotten Tomatoes. So many of us have been using that service. Um, and he's also co-founder and managing partner of PKO Investment, investing in uh, um, both technology and entertainment. And also, um, he is also part of the founding team and board, uh, board member of Gold House Collective. And many, many other titles. I'm not going to read through it. But with that, I want to give the mic to Patrick. Thanks so much, Lee. Uh, so I want to introduce my longtime friend, Daniel. Uh, Daniel is a Bay Area native. He attended the University of Oregon, where he actually started the Wushu Club over there. Uh, and then he later went to Hong Kong to witness the handover. And there he was actually discovered by a film director and ended up making his first film, uh, Bishonen. And then he signed to Jackie Chan's management firm. And the rest is history. He became, quickly became one of the biggest stars in Asia with starring in over 60 films, and later made his way over to Hollywood, starring in films such as Warcraft, Geostorm, Tomb Raider, and most recently, Reminiscence, alongside Hugh Jackman. He starred in the lead role in three seasons of AMC's Into the Badlands, and most recently, season four of HBO's Westworld, which I'm watching right now. Um, and he will be playing Song Kong in Disney's upcoming American-born Chinese, alongside Michelle Yeoh. Uh, one other thing I wanted to mention was, um, along with Hollywood actor Daniel Day Kim, in the past few years, he's become very outspoken around the Stop Asian Hate movement. So please welcome Daniel. Hi. How are you guys doing? So uh, before we get started, just wanted to, uh, the kind folks at Heista knew about our shared history, and they wanted me to moderate this fire Street chat because Dan and I have known each other for a long time. So Since I want we were kids, like yeah. 19 years old. Yeah. Exactly. So just wanted to highlight some of the, I guess, major times we kind of intersected. Um, basically, it was three different times. The first was Wushu. Uh, when we were back in college, we were both quite hardcore when we were training there. Crazy about it. Trained with a few different coaches in Berkeley. We went to China together, trained yep. with the Beijing Wushu team. Yeah. For a month. Yeah. And I even remember one time there was the uh, Tap Mao Wong tournament. It was a big tournament in the Bay Area. And we both competed, and uh, Dan got first, and I got second. But uh, that, I have to say, that's the only time I ever beat him. He always beat me. So. Um, and then the second time we kind of intersected again was a few years later, uh, Dan was actually directing a movie called The Heavenly Kings, and he actually like, pitched me. Him and his friend Terrence pitched me, and I invested into the film. Uh, and it starred Dan and three of his entertainment friends, Terrence, Andrew, and Conroy. And they made a uh, fake boy band called Alive and made a mockumentary around the film trying to make a statement about the en entertainment industry in Hong Kong. And the film did quite well. It uh, won a few awards, and it actually played at a number of international film festivals, including the Hong Kong International Film Festival, Hawaii, and San Francisco. And then the third time we kind of inter intersected was for AliveNotDead.com. And that was actually a website for the boy band that we kind of converted into a social network uh, trying to help celebrities and artists connect to their fans as well as to each other. And so it was basically the four uh, Alive Boys as well as my co-founder Steven and I from Rotten Tomatoes working together. Right, and then Facebook happened. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but we were, we were actually doing stuff like um, we hosted the official sites for Jet Li, Jackie Chan, Karen Mock, Kelly Hu, a number of different artists. So that's uh, kind of a very quick s summary of our shared history. So in terms of format, we're doing this as a bit of a crossfire chat, cross fireside chat where we're just going to talk about some topics around Asian representation in media and Asian hate. 
And at the end, we actually have a little bit of Q&A, and I've been given a number of questions from, that were submitted online to us that I'll be going through at the end. So let's get started. All right, let's do this. So we're going to start with Asian representation in media. And I think, when I think about Asian representation in media, I almost think about like three generations uh, or three phases of that, Yeah. right? And the first phase would be sort of like this from whenever they started having moving pictures all the way to kind of when we were growing up as kids. Yeah. And I kind of wanted to know for you, like, what was your experience growing up around with Asian representation? What were you seeing in the media at that time? There was very little. Like, I grew up, I was born in the 70s. I grew up in the 70s and 80s. And there was very, very little Asian representation. And ever, whenever I saw an Asian person on screen, I go, like, hey, there's an Asian person. You know, like, you play this game to try and find the, the, the Asian person in screen. And so really, I only had exposure to Bruce Lee, really. And then when I got a little bit older, like very bad representations of us, like uh, Long Duck Dong from 16 Candles, you know, or the same, ca same actor playing the uh, Japanese factory worker in Gung Ho, you know, things that, that put Asians in a very stereotypical light and was not necessarily representative of our culture. So I'd, sl I'd see that. But I go, that's not, that's not us, that's not me, you know? And so that's why, like, people ask me, did you want to, were you trying to be an actor since you were a little kid? I never thought of it as a kid because I didn't see people like me on screen as a kid, so I didn't think it was an option. And that's why I became an architect, you know, because I didn't think it would be possible to become an actor. And it wasn't until I moved to Hong Kong and someone told me that I could be that and that they empowered me and kind of activated me to that that I was able to have that mind shift and think that I could do something like that. And when you were growing up, like for me, I, when I saw these things, I had the same kind of feeling. There was back then, especially early on, there was a lot of, you know, yellow face, right? If you go back really early, you have stuff like... Mickey Rooney at Breakfast at Tiffany's, you Mickey know, like Rooney. white people pretending to be Asian people, David Yo Carradine in Kung Fu. Yul Brenner, yeah, Yul Catherine Brenner. Hepburn, yes. Don Wayne, like all these things. And, and also, I would say during that time, it was a lot of like, if they had Asians, they weren't really laughing with us, they were laughing at us. Yeah. You know, sure. and at least for me, I always felt like when I was growing up, I, I felt invisible. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I specifically remember like, a, for me, it was a bit traumatic. It was like fifth grade PE class. They were having like, teaching us trying to, how to dance, like a square dance or something. And they lined up all the girls and all the boys it, all the girls in one line, all the boys in one line, and then they had the girls pick which boy they wanted to dance with, right? And it's going down the line, and it gets two-thirds of the way down, and it's one of the most popular girls in the class, and then she picks me, right? And you would normally think, oh, that's great, except she's crying as she's picking me because all the popular boys had already been picked, and, uh, and I think I was like the, the, the least bad of what was left, you know? And so that stuff, it sticks to you. Like, yep, yep, it and I does. definitely felt... I was like incredibly shy growing up. Um, it wasn't ex until like Wushu and those things where I was around sort of like people like me and had the same interest as me that I feel like I started opening up. So yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if you had any kind of similar experiences. Yeah, I was uh, very lucky that I, I went to, I grew up in a town called Arinda. Some people may know that. And it's a very small, white, upper middle class town. And, but I was very lucky in that it, the elementary school I went to in my grade, there was me, there was Chinese American, there was a, my, my, ended up being one of my best friends from nursery school, who I still am friends with now. He's half Japanese, half Chinese, and then this Filipino kid, right? And he, the, the guy, Mike Sato, the Chinese Japanese kid, was one of the most popular kids in the school. So we kind of hung together. And then the Filipino kid was, um, he came from Richmond and he came from public school, so he had to go back two years. So he was two years older than us. So he was the toughest kid in school, right? So nobody messed with us. Right, so I had a really kind of protected situation there, where even the bullies did not mess with us because there was Mario Gonzalez who would beat him up. Right, so so I I felt like I was lucky in that I didn't feel direct racism, but I knew I was aware of what was happening, and I aware I was aware of this idea of be feeling invisible that we as Asian Americans in the American landscape were kind of going around you know a black and white space really, and we were trying to fit in where we could fit in. You know, or or do the things that we are allowed to do, and I definitely had that sense, definitely growing up, and a sense that that we were uh, not accepted as part of necessarily part of the American landscape or the American fabric. 
Yeah, I mean, I think for me, I, I didn't see very much outright racism growing up. I mean, very little, like kindergarten, you know, some or people doing the ching chong, ching chong type of thing, but very, very little. It was more just the feeling of just not belonging, not fitting in. Yeah, and then I had also the, the unique experience that my next door neighbor was black, and he was the only black kid in the school, only black kid in the town, and I could witness what that kind of racism was like. And it wasn't necessarily hardcore racism, but it was prejudice, definitely. And so I oftentimes was defending him. Because Asians, as you know, we are kind of white adjacent. We have the, some of the privileges of white people. And so I was able to help stand up for him in, in situations like that. Um, but we all know also that being white adjacent doesn't mean you're part of the society. You're, you're, you're allowed to be here at a certain level, and then that's where the glass ceiling or the bamboo ceiling starts, right? Right, exactly. Um, yeah, I was. I wanted to ask a little bit more about Bruce Lee, because I know for you, sure. uh, as far as I know, he's like was a pretty big inspiration for you, and he, and he was for me too. Like when I was growing up, you would sometimes see, I think it was like on the weekends, in the middle of the day, sometimes they show movies from Hong Kong, like the Shaw Brothers stuff or Bruce Lee, and, and it was very inspirational for me. That was like one of the reasons why I wanted to learn martial arts was because of Jet Li, Jackie Chan, Bruce Lee, and I want, wonder if you could speak more about that. Sure, I mean, he literally was the only person on the screen that was like powerful, you know, uh, cool, uh, even arrogant, because in our culture we're, told, we're taught not to be arrogant. We're taught, told to be humble, right? You come to America as a new immigrant, be humble. Don't be arrogant, right? And so he he had this self confidence that I'd never seen before from anybody in our culture, right? And so and to maybe even to an extreme, because what I heard, you know, I learned later that even in Hong Kong, it rubbed a lot of people the wrong way when he went back. But the point is, is there was a strong male. Uh, figure on the big screen for me to to look at and go, hey, that's cool. I wanna I wanna be like him. You know, I wanna do that stuff. So this all that stuff led me into uh, being a huge fan of martial arts movies and then wanting to learn martial arts itself. And then an indirect um, result of that was then it got me closer to my culture, because as we all know, I mean, some of you are first generation immigrants, but a lot of you have American kids now, right? And how close do they really want to be to their culture? Not really anymore, right? But it was really, martial arts was really what tied me to my culture and made me proud to be Chinese. Because I remember making the conscious decision, I, I want to do Kung Fu, not karate, not Taekwondo, not wrestling. I want to do a martial art that's from my culture, right? And that I see uh, Bruce Lee, Jet Li, Jackie Chan, those people on screen. So those, those people were all huge influences in, in my life and giving me a sense of confidence. Right, and I think with Bruce Lee especially, he would, you know, he was, kind of Asian American, I mean, he actually did spend a lot of time growing up here, and I think one thing with him that was super cool was he was actually teaching folks like, was like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and... Uh, Steve McQueen, Steve McQueen, James Coburn, and I think he learned something. I mean, I think, you know, he he's also American-born, but he came back here at like uh, teenage years, right? So he had to kind of learn to become American, and what he learned from those guys you know, Steve McQueen, James Coburn, these were like the biggest movie stars at the time, is a sense of confidence, right? And to be, um, and maybe that arrogance, and be cool, right? And those kind of things, he learned from them, and he became that, right, um, over time while teaching with them. And it's interesting, because even now, you don't really see something like that, I think, where, you're, where you're, you have this Asian American that's actually like teaching the world's top stars or, or interacting with them that much. Yeah, yeah. Um, so let's kind of transition over to I would say the second phase of, of Asian representation in media. Um, it was in the 90s, and you would have a bunch of, like, on the Asian American side, a lot of starts and stops. Movies like Joy Luck Club, there's a TV show, All American Girl, Vanishing Sun. Oh man, someone's sabotaging this talk. <laughs> or someone leading gets, let's just keep going, let's okay. keep going. Uh, Martial Law, Better Luck Tomorrow, right? And then you also had, in Hong Kong, this wave of artists coming over and doing a lot of films in America, like Jet Li, Jackie Chan, Michelle Yeoh, Chow Yun-Fat. Um, this was like in the late 90s. Mm -hmm. That's around the time, too, when you kind of got into uh, the film industry. Yeah, I think I started in 97, but that was over in Hong Kong, not here, right? But in that time period, let's say the early 90s, late, maybe late 80s, early 90s, you started to see like Joy Luck Club, things like that oh, we're being allowed to tell our stories now, right? Uh, uh, here's an opportunity. But then, you know, Joy Luck Club happened, and then nothing for many years, right? 
that was the one Asian American drama that was out there that was about us, about our experiences, about our life. They were seeing us on TV or on the big screen, and then it just stopped, right? Made a lot of money for Hollywood, and they moved on, right? Um, and then, but you started to see a little bit more of it, you know, again, with the wave of the Hong Kong people that came over, Jackie Chan and Chow Yun-Fat and all those people, started to see more flashes of it. And then now it kind of evolved to this third phase now you're probably talking about, which is, you know, crazy rich Asians and all that stuff. Then now we're seeing a wholly, totally different perspective altogether. Like I think then was a couple of people had, and this is, I'm talking about white people in Hollywood with power, gave us, you know, the keys to the city for a minute, you know, and so we had that, but then it wasn't a consistent um, thing. We're still not part of the American fabric. We're still not part of American society at that point. And, and I remember during that time when you were uh, still in Hong Kong, your career's taking off over there, there started to be some, some action in Hollywood where they're starting to introduce a little bit of like Asians into the films, right? Mm -hmm. And for you, what was your consideration around um, do I continue to grow my career in uh, Asia versus do I try to you know, make a jump? Uh, it was pretty easy. I mean, I came back during those times every once in a while to have meetings and stuff like that, but still not a major interest in, in helping Asian Americans tell their stories at all. So I just went back because I had a great time telling Asian stories for Asian audiences and not have to think about race at all. I mean, that's the one thing that was really eye-opening for me as growing up American uh, up until 97, I had to think about race all the time, every single day, right? I had to think of how different I was than other Americans around me. And then I go to Hong Kong, and of course, being American born, I'm not local, but I looked like everybody else, you know? Uh, I had black hair, I you know, ate, ate with chopsticks and all that kind of stuff. So, so, and then even the roles I was getting was not based on my race, it was based on my ability to play the role or whether people liked seeing me play that certain role. And so race was never a part of the issue. For 20 years, I never had to think about race at all until I came back in 2016, and then I had to like put that filter on again and, and look at the world with a different lens, you know? And so um, it was very freeing to be in that environment where I didn't have to think about race and I didn't have to think about a pressure to perform for white people, you know? Um, there still is that today, you know? Even though we have more opportunities to now, uh, we still have to perform. We still have to make money for Hollywood to prove ourselves, you know? I remember uh, when the film Better Luck Tomorrow came out. A uh, few years later, I had actually met, uh, was it Roger Fan, who was one of the leads in that movie. And I think we were talking, and we were actually talking about your career. And he was kind of saying for him, you know, he, tried to, he made the decision to try to make it in Hollywood at the time. And, and he looked, when he was looking at you, he was like, oh, that what if of, he didn't think he could go to you know, a foreign country like Hong Kong and actually try to make it there when he didn't really speak Chinese or any of that stuff. Um, for you, have you thought about like, had, if you tried to start in Hollywood first, how do you think that would have gone? Would you have been able uh, to get the career you have now? I think I would have given up very quickly because, you know, from the stories I hear of my fellow Asian American actors, like 10 years of going to audition after audition after audition and just hoping for some little nugget or crumb to be given to you. You know, I, I was really lucky, and it's after I did my first movie, I mean, first of all, I was the lead actor in the, my first movie ever, you know? So that would have never happened here, for sure, right? And then from that point onwards, I was the lead actor for my whole career, you know? And so I never had to fight even my own friends, because that's what they had to do. They, there was competition with each other to get that one freaking role that one tiny role of a dishwasher in the back scene of some stupid movie, right? And they're fighting for that. And I, that would have broken my soul. Like, if I saw all that, I would just, it would have tore me up. So I don't think I would be here if I tried to make it in Hollywood first. Right, right. Um, so yeah, let's, let's look at, uh, let me see, phase. Oh, actually, there's a couple more things within phase two that I think would be interesting to talk about. Like, one is stereotypes. Mm -hmm. So when you still had, you know, one of the complaints, I think, with Asian representation in media is that we see a lot of stereotypes on screen, right? The Asian male is doing kung fu or is the computer programmer, engineer, scientist, yeah. right? Yeah. And uh, a lot of them in here, though, today, right? Yeah. <laughs> they, they, there's a couple of martial artists right here, right? Exactly. There's a stereotype they, in here. They never have, like, a love interest, right? Mm -hmm. uh, or the women are, like, the dragon ladies, things like that. 
Um, or, or even a mixed race relationship, you never see that. You know? Yes, yes, all, all the time. it's an Asian woman with a white man, right? You see that, right? Right. Um, but then what's interesting is when you think about like the Kung Fu side, almost all of that was coming from Asia. Mm -hmm. So they're importing stuff, but they're actually kind of importing the stereotypes. Yeah. And I'm, I'm curious, like, have you thought about the stereotypes of, of in, with Asian representation in media and how that's all affected us? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's because all of that content was being written by white people. So they're looking at our culture through a filtered lens or a different lens of what their experience is with Asian people, but it's not necessarily the truth or is it not necessarily accurate representation. So what they saw were the, the peaks of our culture, right? Martial arts, uh, this, that, that. And they just take those little things and then try and make a story that's relatable to them, but it's not really accurate re representation of us, right? And that's what this what's changing now. I think in the third phase that you're gonna about to get to, I keep referring to it, um, we're getting the keys to the car now. And so we are writing our own stories. They're ri Asian writers. And this is the other thing, was there was no system, right? So you have Hollywood is a bunch, or for that period, was a bunch of older white guys, right? Uh, the writers were a bunch of older white men, right? And so all that, you, you, how, would, how you would you expect it to be any different, right? Because that's all they know, right? And it's not only until now that you're seeing executives with power that are not white, right? Maybe black, but maybe that they're more sensitive to the cultural issues of what we need to, to represent all, all cultures today. Um, but those experiences are coming in now and they're demanding more authentic voices and more authentic stories. And so therefore that's why we're getting this third phase now, right? Um, but it's an evolution, I don't have any, um, hatred or, or, or anger towards that. It, this is how things evolve. They, things have to evolve. It's just that happened really late with us, you know. Right, right, exactly. So yeah, let's jump over to the third phase. So essentially third phase is basically kind of like post-Crazy Rich Asians. Yeah. Right? Uh, when that movie came out, I remember thinking like, is this going to be another Joy Luck Club and Better Luck Tomorrow? Like, is it just gonna pop in, spike, and then nothing? for another decade. Another 25 years, yeah. right. And I know that film, when it came out, it basically doubled all the box office estimates that everyone had for opening weekend. And essentially from there, I think it really kind of made Hollywood realize like, hey, you can actually make money with a film with Asians in it that's not martial arts. Right, right. right. Um, and so do you want to speak a little bit about that? Like this kind of what's happened since Crazy Rich Asians? Yeah, I think that the you know with culture changing also with you know world culture or my, more uh, a need for more diversity, um, there's become a more of a movement towards telling you know authentic stories from our people, and so crazy rich Asians being one of them. And one thing I want to say about that also is what's important in the success of that is that we as a community came out and supported it, right? That's why it made so much money in the theaters, right? Everybody Gold House was created basically to support this film, right? Um, and that was which there was the big game changer is because we also were not necessarily supporting ourselves. And this is something that I want to say today is that we have to support each other if we're going to evolve and get better at what we're doing in, 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 in all sectors of society right now. Is that we all as, as Asians, not even just as Chinese Americans or whatever, as Asians we need to support and s celebrate each other. So like when I see Joe Coy's movie, which is, he's a Filipino-American, Easter Sunday fail, that hurts me too. Like, because it's, it's the w white America is looking at that as an Asian story, not just as a Chinese, uh, Filipino story, or not just a Chinese story, they're looking at it as an Asian story. So we need to think collectively also to how do we help our sisters and brothers that are also trying to do it out there. So that's a very important part of it. Uh, sorry, I, did, I digressed. What no, actually, that's a, that brings up a good point is, uh, you know, Asians, it's a tricky thing here in the States because, you know, in other countries, it's like, oh, there's Chinese, there's Japanese, there's Korean. And here we're, we're Asians, you just, we just get lumped together. Yeah. Um, and, but we're not like a monolith, like yeah. we're not really just one unit. Like even within Ch China, right, you have Chinese, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and they're pretty different. Um, and so you have issues like Easter Sunday, which is like a Filipino film, and most Asians are like, oh, if I'm, I'm not Filipino, I'm not gonna go watch that movie. Um, or, or similarly, uh, casting issues, right? Uh, I remember, what was it, uh, Memoirs of a Geisha? Yeah. 
And all, there was all a, Chinese people playing. Yeah, it was all Chinese playing the lead roles, Chinese females, not Japanese females, and and that was a big problem, I guess. But like, for Western films, it's not as big of a problem. You know, Tom Holland plays Spider-Man, and he's got this New York accent, but you actually listen to him in the interviews, and he's like from London or something, right? right. And and no one seems to have an issue. They're not like, oh, he's not American, right? But people are okay with it. So do you want to speak a little bit about that, like just Asians as a monolith, and um, how that works in, in terms of representation and supporting each other? Yeah, it's, that's it's complicated, right? Because we have so many different cultures and languages and beliefs and all that within the Asian diaspora, right? And so uh, we are different, but we learned during all the COVID Asian hate stuff that most of America treats us as one, right? One monolith. And so you, we kind of have to thread that needle in a different way in that sometimes we have to look at ourselves as a monolith, but sometimes we gotta go into the nuance and the details of our own individual cultures, right? And I think in the way of uh, supporting our, each other, we have to support each other as a monolith in America. This is important here because we're being treated that way, right? So it's important for us to support our, um, you know, Cambodian, Vietnamese, Filipino, Indian, uh, Pakistani brothers and sisters out there because we're all being thrown into the same pot anyway, right? So that's very important to, if we're gonna have a success as Asians and, and Asian Americans in this country and better representation, we have to support all of it. And it's very important that we do um, and not become insular and not to do the typical Asian thing which is stay in my lane, stay in my niche, don't cause any trouble. Be bold about it, be supportive of, of, of uh, different, different, different cultures within our own culture. Um, that's very important. Um, and I think, you know, also to be aware that to not, this is why I say it's difficult because to also not accept people treating you as a monolith either, right? You have to explain, you have to educate people, you have to tell them that what are, what are the differences. When they say, how's your Japanese? I go, no, I'm Chinese, it's different, right? You know, that, that happened to me all the time. Oh, you live in Hong Kong now, is your Japanese very fluent? I go, they don't speak Japanese in Hong Kong. <laughs> you know, you have to educate people, right? You just have to do that um, and be patient with that. Um, but at the same time, again, we have to step out for our community as a macro community and for the micro community as well. Right, right, definitely. I, I'm wondering also, if, have you thought about the, I, I feel like at the same time that Crazy Rich Asians happened, there's also been this convergence of just all these things coming in from Asia, right? You have K-pop, BTS, right? You have anime. Anime is like started trickling in early 2000s, but like really, I think, exploded. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, now, I mean, I, I remember I, I went to Target a couple weeks ago. You go in there, and they're selling like just T-shirts with all these like Asian uh, anime characters on it. Naruto like, and all that. My Hero Academia, like all this kind of stuff is super cool. And then also at the same time, there's like the Chinese box office, I think, that kind of started playing an effect on, on Hollywood where they would actually have to think about what films are they making, can it actually get in China? I, I think the most noticeable that I remember in recent history was like a X-Men, Days of Future Past, and it had like Fan Bingbing in there. And I'm like, whoa, what's going on there? Like, kind of interesting where you have these things coming from China that are, I think, also playing a role in Asian representation in media yeah, here. Yeah, I mean, it's just like any other industry is a globalization of the world and that you can't just sell one product in one region anymore, right? So you want to make your product a global product. And China is a huge, huge, huge region that has you know over a billion people that you can you know monetize off of. So, so it's important to make uh, products or films that include those cultures as well. So you see that now with a lot of, a lot of the Mar Marvel properties actually, like they touch on Asian culture, they touch on uh, Latino culture, they touch on all these other things because they're trying to scoop up be more representative of what the world is, right? It, I think gone are the days of where, uh, like the 70s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, where like, America, go USA, like the, those stories still sell all over the world. Like people are tired of that now. People, you know, figured out America is not necessarily number one anymore. And so you do have to tell stories that represent a global culture. And so that's part of it. China, the China market, the China box office is a huge part of it. And obviously, you know, at the end of the day, it's about making money. Right, and so um, those markets provide a huge amount of revenue for film companies. And it, well, relating to like the K-pop thing, it was an interesting story for us is when we were actually having our baby, one of the nurses came in and, and she was white. And somehow we ended up talking about Asian stuff and she mentioned that her daughter, who's also white, was really, really into BTS. 
so into BTS that she actually like snuck her mom's credit card to buy a ticket to see the concert <laughs> in Korea. Oh my God. <laughs> and so when the mom found out, th the mom was cool, she actually ended up buying plane tickets so they went together. But like growing so, up- I mean, this is an example of how representation is great, right? Because that caused a white couple, a white family to go to Korea and learn about Korean culture um, on their own because they thought BTS is cool. You know, and, they're, and I see it a lot. I see it, especially with the K-pop stuff. Like all these K-pop fans, learning about Korean culture, speaking Korean, eating Korean food. Like when I was a little kid, like white people did not eat Asian food. They did not like it, right? And now it's like all over the all over the place, right? And so it's a really great way, our, you know, our entertainment is a really great way to extend our culture and to reach out to, to different cultures and share, you know, share with. And I think entertainment is one of the easiest ways to do that. Right, right. Um, a little bit about the, the film industry now. Uh, one thing I've noticed with films even now, that even the ones with Asians, I feel like they fall mostly into two buckets. You do have the full ensemble, everyone's Asian, right? Like obviously things from Asia, like Squid Games, um, right. but as well as things locally, like everything everywhere all at once. Or it's, The Farewell or... Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And then on the flip side, you still have, I think a little bit of this using Asians as set dressing. Right. Yes. The most recent uh, Stranger Things, there's like this Asian counselor. It has a couple lines. Um, I just we just watched the Fantastic Beasts movie, and there's like some people running for office, and there's some Asians running for office. I don't think there was there's a bunch of Asians in those scenes. I don't think any Asian had even a line that I could remember. Right. Like, um, so there's still kind of this dual path with with these Asians in film. How do you? I feel like I don't still don't see that many. Uh, well, Westworld is one, but not that many where there's actually like integration integration uh, with Asians in actually like real roles and that's a set dressing. Right. Yeah, I agree. I agree. We were like for a long time being NPCs, right? <laughs> um, but yeah, I think we're in a transition phase now. So this is the transition. We're getting opportunities to tell our own stories in our own films, right? But we're also being put into other things like me and Westworld and all that. Um, that is heavily to do with the director and showrunner being Chinese American, you know, and wanting representation in it. Um, but it's changing, it's slowly changing, and I think we'll get to the point where we are considered part of the American fabric and that we'll be in stories that are American stories, not just Asian stories, right? Because we are also all Americans living here, right? And so we're, we have our own stories to tell, but we also have a collective story as, as Americans in general to tell as a whole, right? Um, and that's why we are called a melting pot or whatever, yeah. Um, let's see, so I think let's move over to talk a little bit about Asian hate. Uh, I just wanna say one more thing about representation. Okay. It's not just in an entertainment that's important. So three things in American society are so important to all Americans, which is entertainment, sports, and politics, right? What, when you turn on the TV, what are they talking about? One of these three things, right? And what are we least represented in? Sports, entertainment, and politics, right? I remember my parents telling me, don't, don't play football, you can get hurt, right? Don't go into politics, it's tricky. There's tricky people, right? But because of what my parents told me, we're grossly underrepresented in all those fields. So we need to step up and represent in those fields, and also as people in different industries, you need to support those people in those fields. So the polit Asian politicians, the Asian uh, 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 people in entertainment, and the Asian athletes, you need to support them. When Jeremy Lin plays a basketball game, we should all go, right, and show that there's buying power to support players like that, right? Um, if you don't support that and step out for these people in any of these industries, another one who I'm supporting now, Andy Kim, Congressman Andy Kim, right? A lot of people famously know him as on the night of the January 6th insurrection, after it all happened, he was there cleaning up the mess, right? And this is how he was showing that he wants to be part of the American environment is like the, his love for America was that in that moment and that move when I saw him do that that moved me and I go this guy is truly Asian in what he was thinking but also truly American in, in what he did his actions so we need to support people like that and you need to educate yourselves on who are those people to give them the power so they can make change in the society because like a lot of us are NPCs in this world no, you know, this is to use a tech term for you tech people non-player um, characters right and we need to be active players now, 
we need to be active, we need to claim our stake, and we need to make a change. And, and it's not going, oh, well, somebody else will do that, or whatever. And even people in tech, all of you guys who are CEOs and businessmen, uh, running companies and have power, it's very important for you to actively think about how you can make change, not just in your company, but in the world around you, right? And that means also inner intercultural connectivity, right? We need to reach out to people in, in the, in the African-American communities, in the Latin communities. Uh, black and brown people, totally upper, underrepresented in tech, right? How do you change that? How can you help them, right? Because when we go into this Asian hate stuff we're gonna talk about now, we'll see why we've been pitted against each other and we need to fight against that and help each other. Right, no, that's su such good points. I, I would definitely say one, one thing I'm curious about though is when we look at the entertainment side, maybe not so much the politics and sports side, but on the entertainment side, we are doing a lot better these last you know, four or five years, right? Sure, sure. Yet, at the same time, it feels like there's more Asian hate, you know, anti-Asian sentiment than ever. So uh, how does that square? Like, how, why is that happening? Yeah, that was shocking to me, because like, you know, crazy rich Asians happened, and you know, uh, BTS was here, and it felt like, whoa, cool, I'm like, proud to be Asian in America now. And then we're getting beat and killed and pushed over and robbed in the streets, right? And it's like, what is this? this is a massive disconnect here. And so clearly, like, a lot of this was going on before COVID, right? But COVID, the rhetoric of Trump, uh, talking about the China virus, you know, kept saying China in such a weird way. Like, every time he said it, I just want to punch him in the face, right? Like, the way he said it every time, because he was, you know, what he was so good at is getting a rise out of people, you know, getting people to have a reaction, right? And by him just saying China flu, China virus, like that was making people angrier and angrier every time. And so therefore, then people wanted to take it out on somebody. So you, you with the dark, dark hair and the brown skin, like I don't care if you're not Chinese, you're Filipino, right? Well, whatever, it doesn't care. You brought this here, I'm gonna kill you, right? Like that mentality started to happen. And with his administration, it almost made it okay to be openly racist, right? Like racism definitely was part of society since the beginning in this country, right? This country is founded on racism, okay? But the point is it was hidden. It was hidden, right? And so and now with, with Trump coming out, it just became overt. And then we started taking like real physical and emotional abuse on the streets. Um, and it was shocking to me. It was absolutely shocking. And what was even more shocking was we went through a whole, f I'm gonna use a bad word here, fucking year of it, and nobody wanted to talk about it. No mainstream media was talking about it. And that's what activated me and Daniel Day Kim to get involved and do something to bring attention to this issue. You know? And this is what I mean by stand, you have to stand up. We can't just take this shit anymore. You have to stand up and stake your claim. We belong here just as much as anyone else does. And so therefore we have the same rights as everyone else. So this humble attitude of like, oh, it'll just go away someday. No, it won't. It will not go away. You have to stand up and be an active participant. Stop being an NPC and be an APC, you know? And, and <laughs> great point. And do you want to talk a little bit more about how you got involved? You know, there's a bunch of crimes that are happening and then suddenly there's all this press about you, Daniel Day Kim coming out. I remember there was something about reward money, all that kind of yeah. stuff. It, it was purely an emotional response because like, when I saw Visha Ratana Pakdi get pushed over and killed, that like fucking pissed me off, right? And like be, even before that, when so I, it started when I saw this article in Next Shark about an older lady in in New York who was walking down the street, she got slapped in the face, and then this kid lit her on fire, right? Lit her shirt on fire, right? And so I reached out. I saw an article that this community center that she belonged to had put out a cash reward. So I called them and I said, I want to match a reward and double this, right, double down on this. And uh, you know, they caught, ended up catching the kids without our help. So then they were minors and all this stuff and so they couldn't press charges against them so it disappeared. And there was not much news about it. And then it kept going, all this Asian hate crime kept going for another, I think, six to eight months. And it was when, it was that series of events in Oakland with, or in San Francisco and Oakland with Visha first and then the several elder members uh, in Oakland Chinatown getting pushed to the ground that I was like, Jesus Christ, this cannot happen anymore. So that's when I stood up. And I, first of all, I reposted it on social media and just super angry. And then Daniel Day Kim called me right away. He's like, hey, let's do something about this. Right? And I'm like, okay, let's do it. And so then we called the uh, Oakland uh, Chinatown's uh, Chamber of Commerce 
and found out about how we could help with that situation. Then we doubled the um, reward as well. And they ended up catching the guy outside of the reward for something else, and it turns out they realized it was him. But then that's what kind of catapulted us, us into the Stop Asian Hate movement, because prior to that, there was no media coverage, very little in the mainstream media, and all of a sudden, all of America became aware that this was happening, and that kind of we achieved our goal in terms of trying to get it out there, right? And, and I feel like though, like, that was super good, super positive. It was great that they, they caught everyone. But when you look at even this year in New York, right, there was a Michelle that got pushed into the subway. There was a Christina that got followed up into her apartment and stabbed to death. That was January and February of, of this year. Mm -hmm. it, it feels like crime in general is rising and, and it's disproportionately targeting Asians. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, we are targets because well, you also have to clearly separate what's going on. There are clear Asian hate crimes. Then there are crimes of opportunity targeting Asians because Asians are easy targets. And that's because, first of all, we're known to carry cash. We're known to wear our jewelry. We're known to, you know, elderly walking around in the streets, right? All those kinds of things make us easy targets, right? So crime is up in general. And then these criminals are out there going, what, what's the lowest hanging fruit? And they're going for that, right? Then you have the Asian hate crimes. That's a whole different thing, right? And so a lot of people are mixing the two. A lot of people are mixing the two and going, this is all the same thing, but it's actually not the same thing. So you have to be clear when you're reading about an incident, what it was, right? Like Michelle Goh's incident. No, wait, Michelle is the one that got followed into her apartment, right? Uh, she got pushed away. So some of those are cases of not Asian hate, it's just mentally disturbed people on, on the streets doing crazy things, right? And that, that goes into another talk about, and then we could talk hours about this, about homelessness, um, the drug problems, mental health in this country. That's a whole other thing that we need to address. But it's part, of, it's part of this Asian hate circle, right? Because people that are not mentally stable are maybe being influenced by some of the crazy rhetoric that's going on out there and thinking Asians are the root of their problems, right? So, so we have to look at the thing as a whole thing. I mean, it took me uh, three years of working on this, like a lot, there's so much to unpack. And if you ask me now, like, how do we resolve this? I, don't, I still don't know, right? But I know that it goes much, much, much deeper than going, we need more police, because that's not necessarily gonna solve it. And that's a very stupid American way of solving the problem, is put a Band-Aid over the, the, the problem. We need to use the Asian way, which is like, like Chinese medicine, get to the root of the problem, it's your liver. It's not, it's not your eyes are yellow, your liver has got a problem, right? So what is the root of the problem is, is, is racism has been a thing in this country for a long time and we need to unpack that. And like, for example, a lot of people, are, there's a lot of anti-black sentiment going around saying that black people are attacking Asians, right? You have to unpack that even further and going, is systemic racism creating this situation where all people of color are being pitted against each other? Right? And when you understand that, then you understand that you have to have sympathy and empathy for all these situations that are happening. And it's not as simple as going, more police or more guns. Oh, go get a gun, that'll solve the problem. No, it's not gonna solve the problem. You know, it's not gonna solve the problem. So we, we need to make an effort to go much, much, much deeper. And that's why I'm saying people in power here, you have the power to make changes, right? So let's say you, as an Asian person, start a scholarship fund for black and brown people in tech. That, that helps, that starts to help, it starts to move the meter, right? Yes, of course, we have to support our own Asian brothers and sisters, but we also have to support the other um, underserved people in our communities, and that's how we move as a collective group of people of color in this country, and, and I'm not discounting white people either, we all have to think about this way, as, as Americans as a whole, how do we help each other with empathy and love and move forward, instead of uh, thinking about defense and, and, and hatred because the hatred and the anger, it just gets worse and worse and worse, and we're gonna have a civil war and everyone's gonna die, you know? So we have to go to the root of the problem and start to unpack it slowly and then figure out where you can help in those situations. Because everyone always asks me, how can I help? How can I help? Find out what you're capable of doing and what you're capable of helping in your own circle. Like for me, I, I can't solve this problem and a lot of people call me an activist. I'm not an activist. I'm just advocating for this situation and I'm trying to, um, you know, uh, elevate other people who are working in this in this in these fields, whether activists, community members, uh, different groups that are making an effort to to make a change. Right, and I think we're running a little bit low on time, so 
very quickly summarizing some of the stuff about on how to help that you've mentioned. Uh, trying to have everyone stand together, work together. Yes. You, you mentioned Gold House, um, where they actually had the gold opens and they got people to go out and buy out theaters to support Asian films, uh, increasing representation um, of Asians in politics, sports, and culture. Uh, and then you also mentioned the side around, around business and, and yeah. getting people in business to kind of try and support more. I, I'm gonna mention a little bit about Rotten Tomatoes. I, I do know with Rotten Tomatoes, for example, well, when we ran it, we actually supported Better Luck Tomorrow. When it came out, we ran a full ad campaign for free. I remember that. Hong Kong, Inter uh, the San Francisco International Asian American Film Festival, we were always media sponsors of them every year that we ran Rotten Tomatoes. And more recently, uh, something that they did, I think that's been very positive, is traditionally critics are, have been white and male. And in 2018, Rotten Tomatoes actually added 600 critics to increase diversity that were like mostly female, around like uh, gender, race, ethnicity, as well as other platforms. And they actually even donated uh, 350,000 in the past few years to helping aspiring critics from underrepresented groups to pursue their goals around um, being a, a professional film critic. And that was something that uh, on the Rotten Tomatoes side, I think they felt was very important because the critics are the ones who are rating the movies. And if the representation is all white male, you're gonna get a very skewed kind of view yeah, of like a lot of Yeah, like that situation with Turning Red, right? That, that one critic was like, I don't relate to anything in this movie. It's like, really? You don't relate to like being awkward in high school, growing up, you know, any of that, nothing? Right? Yeah, situations like that happen all the time. So you, yeah, we need to diversify all levels of, of everything, actually. And is there anything you want to add as well as around the idea of like how to help? I mean, you said that you don't have the answers, but with this group here, you know, lots of folks here within technology, entertainment, or uh, technology, venture, and business, how, how would you suggest that they support? God, there's so many ways, but I think, first of all, being mindful and conscious of what's happening, right? And, and understanding that you do need to help make a difference. And then finding out, like I said earlier, how you can help. So it can be anywhere from buying a movie ticket and going into the theater as opposed to, oh, it's free on TV, I'll just watch it on streaming at home, right? That doesn't help us, right? You need to go into the theater and buy a ticket and that will help us, right? Um, because that revenue doesn't come back. And if you're talking about re just representation in Hollywood, right? At the end of the day, money is the most important thing. If you can prove that it makes money, it's proof of, proof of work, right? Um, if you can prove it makes money, then, then it, everything will follow, right? And if our community is not supporting our own people and making our own stories out there, then it's never gonna happen for us, right? And if that doesn't happen for us, then we're gonna be grossly underrepresented, we're gonna be continually seen as in, uh, invisible or perpetual foreigners forever, and it's never gonna solve the problem. So do your part, help in any little way you can, whether it's big or small, it makes a difference. Because you know, at the end of the day, there's a lot of us here, right, in this country, and so, a grain of sand seems small, but when you put it all together, you can make a desert, you can make a beach, you know, you can do all that. So m everyone do your part and be conscious, be mindful, think about how you can do it, and think about different ways you can help in any way, not just entertainment, whether it's politicians, uh, athletes, whatever, or even within your own industry, how you can make a change and make it better for all of us. Right, right, definitely. and. We have a, about five minutes left, so I wanted to try to an, uh, ask a couple questions that were submitted online from folks. Uh, let's see. This one's a, a bit tough, I think, is uh, which book, movie, play, or TV series would you like to recommend to anyone looking to gain a deeper understanding of the AAPI cultural experience? Oh, that, that might be hard, but that might be easy. There's a really good documentary series on PBS about Asians, Asians in America. And it's fascinating because it covers all types of Asians, all points of history and time. So, you know, obviously some people are just learning about like the Chinese Exclusionary Act or whatever, but then it covers like um, Indians in Louisiana, you know, all that kind of stuff. And it's really great to, for us to learn about each other, right? Because when I watched it, there was a lot I didn't know, you know, and about Asian American history, about Asian American culture. And I know a lot of you are first generation immigrants, so there's probably a ton of it of American, Asian American history that you don't know either from five, six generations ago. So that five part documentary series is really enlightening, I thought. And it's really comprehensive and great. And not a lot of people watched it and it didn't get a lot of press, but it's a great, great documentary. So take, take a look at that. I think it's called Asian, Asian, Asians in America or something like that, but it's, yeah, on, well, it's on PBS on the streaming app, yeah. Cool, um, and 
Here's another question. Uh, what is your favorite Asian tradition or custom? Do you practice it within your household? Bao jiao zi. Uh, making jiao zi. I, I, I just love that. First of all, it's, I think that that is my favorite. I think it's the most perfect food in the world, right? Because you've got carbohydrates, you have protein, and a little bit of veggies in it, right? And it's all in one little thing that you can just one bite, right? And then making it is such a cool experience. Like every new year, we make it as a family tradition, right? And so my daughter, who's half, you know, only half Chinese, uh, she, that's part of her tradition now. Like she's nine years old, and we've done it every year for Chinese New Year. And so that's something that we look forward to do as a family, you know? And it's fun. It's just fun. Yeah. No, no, that's a, that's a great one. Let's see. How do you teach your own kid, uh, Raven, about your roots? Uh, that's been really important for me um, because she is mixed race, because she's half Chinese, half American, half Jewish. Um, it's important for me for her to know and understand and be proud of her, her, her race. So it started with me putting her in Chinese immersion school. So she's been in Chinese immersion since preschool. Um, her Mandarin is still not that great, but at least she's having exposure to it. And the coolest thing about it is that she identifies as being Asian, as being Chinese, right? She likes Chinese food. It's totally different than when I was growing up in the 70s, 80s. Like my sisters, who are 10 and 12 years older than me, they kind of grew up in a world where you had to assimilate. So they kind of pushed away against their own culture in some ways, right? And so to see my daughter embrace her culture and be proud of it um, is, is really important to me and really, really great thing. It makes me happy to see that, you know? Um, so yeah, Chinese immersion, we watch Chinese movies, um, um, we go to different festivals, we go to the, you know, the uh, Cherry Blossom Festival of Japanese culture, we learn about that, we learn about Korean stuff, we learn about other, other cultures within the Asian culture as well, not just Chinese culture as well. So we, we kind of try to cover it all in some ways. Um, no, yeah, that uh, totally, the uh, learning Chinese, all that stuff, I definitely remember for me too, when I, I would watch uh, this TVB show, it was a Xin Diao Xiaoli, right, with Andy yeah. Lau, uh -huh. and that's basically how I learned Chinese, like to yep. really understand it. Yep. Um, yep. So I, I totally get it. Uh, what do you think we as adults can do to help children in our community find their identity and strength from their experience? I think, I mean, the, the most basic thing is just support them in any way possible. So whatever they want to do, support them. I think, yeah, I kind of grew up with parents that said, don't do this, don't do that a lot, right? And that's hard to, it took me a long time to break out of that mode that I could do something, I could do this, right? And it is, I'm not blaming my parents, they're just being really conservative and safe. Right? But we should encourage our kids to, to let them grow in any way that they feel that they should grow in, not just forcing them to be a doctor or a lawyer you know, because you think that that provides stability. Because at the end of the day, we just want them to be happy. right? It's not necessarily, success is not a monetary thing. Success is something in your heart and how you feel. right? And so if you can raise a child that is a happy, balanced individual, that's already like an amazing thing that you've done, right? So whether they make a lot of money or they don't or whatever, that's secondary, that's not important. You wanna raise a good human being, you know, and, and I think that's the most important thing. So support them in anything they can do. Um, if it happens to be related to your culture and they gravitate to that, that's awesome, it's a bonus, you know? But if you force it down their throat, we all know this, we all experience this from our parents, right? If they shove something down your throat, you're not gonna want it, right? You know, my parents, uh, didn't uh, want me to do a lot of things. I end up, like, they always, always worried about me getting injured. What am I doing now? I'm a martial arts actor in a, in, on screen, right? They get injured all the time, you know? But if I didn't break out of that, I wouldn't have realized my own potential, right? And so you have to give them the opportunity to realize their full potential. Actually, on that note, I'm very curious when you decided to go into entertainment, going to acting and all this kind of stuff, how did they react to that? Yeah, my dad was not happy. You know, he, 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 I did five years of architecture school and I li literally immediately jumped into acting. And for him, it didn't make any sense because he wanted to be an electrical engineer from like seven years old. And he went on that path and then he worked for Bechtel for 25 years and he retired and that's all. It was, it was just a linear path. So for me to like jump all over the place, it didn't make any kind of sense to him, right? But what's interesting now, and it's sad that he, he passed away this year, but I was able to take all those crazy things I was interested in and combine it into one thing now, right? Like martial arts, acting, arts, 
Like I was very, reason why I studied architecture is because I wanted to be an artist, right? I'm able to combine all those things into one thing that I do now. And um, yes, my dad wasn't happy, but I think in the end, he was pretty proud so uh, that I was able to find my own path. My mom was always supportive because she was a university professor, so she knew about how to support young people. So, yeah. Um, all right, let's see, I think we have last one. Uh, I guess here's the question is, uh, is there a particular story that inspired or made an impact on you while you helped or worked with people in our community as an activist? Could you share it with us? Um, I didn't, there, you know, there's a woman named Yuri Kochiyama and she was uh, an activist in the 60s and 70s for the civil rights movement with Malcolm X. And she was very, very close to Malcolm X. And in fact, when he was shot and killed, the, there's a picture of her, she's holding his body when he's, he's, he's about to die, right? And so we don't realize like how deeply ingrained the, like the Asian community was in the black and white civil rights movement, right? And it was very important to me in that moment to realize that we need to step out for each other. We need to help each other. We need to help the black community, the black community needs to help us, the Latin community, vice versa, all of that. And so to see her back in the day like being one of the only Asian Americans to really be part of that civil rights movement and realize that this is a human issue, it's not a race issue, it's about humanity, being humane to each other, right? Um, that was really enlightening to me. So I, I, I read a lot about her, studied her, and, and that was probably the most enlightening thing I learned about uh, uh, the civil rights movement. There's another, so another woman, Grace Lee Boggs, who was married to another famous uh, black activist at the time, and she's written very many books on how um, you know, uh, the civil rights movement is important to American society, important in order for us to move forward. So uh, those two people, two Asians that were working in black civil rights movements uh, were very influential in, 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 in how this world, I mean, how this country got formed. Right, in post 60s, 70s, yeah. That's interesting, I, I actually did not know about either of those. I mm -hmm. think mainly on the entertainment side, I, was, I, I knew about people like you know, Ben Fong Torres and stuff like that. Sure, that, sure. That also yeah, yeah, those guys were around, they were doing stuff, but I wouldn't say necessarily that they moved the meter as much. Um, they, were represent, they were there doing their thing, but I would say that these two people were very active and really trying to make a change. Yeah, and ho hopefully we'll have more people like that uh, in the future. So thanks so much, Dan, for uh, doing this fireside chat Thank you. Uh, with Haisa. Thank you, guys. Thanks for all, all of you attending. And, and thanks so much to Haisa for having us, for uh, Lake, Dan, and everyone else. Thank you.